The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. In 1979, our guest today, Angela Williams, flipped in a V-Drive boat going 100 miles an hour, and she was underwater for 15 minutes. She was 20 years old at the time, and when she drowned, she says, something that is far beyond words happened. After going through a life review, she transitioned into the light, and she knew she was home. Angela, welcome to NDE Radio. Hi, Lee. Oh, good to hear your voice. You too. First question everyone must ask you, why were you doing 100 miles an hour in in a V-Drive boat? (laughs) That is a good question. I was not driving. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) Uh, Well, you know, I had just broken up with my high school sweetheart and I was, you know, starting college and a friend of mine um, had this V-Drive boat um, it's a racing boat, and mm-hmm. he asked me to go out with him on the 4th of July, and we were just friends, and, you know, I was very reluctant. I, I said no, you know, and he kept pestering me, and um, I finally said, okay, if you don't drink and you keep it under 60, and he did that all day long, mm-hmm. you know, we, we had a really good time, and um, at the end of the day, we were at Mike's parents' house, which is over by the bridge where they were going to sh- uh, have the the Fourth of July fireworks. Mm-hmm. And there was probably about I don't know fifty, maybe even a hundred people there. And um, you know, we were all just having a really good time, you know, Fourth of July barbecue. And um, the sun, the lake had cleared off, and the sun had just set was setting behind the hills to the west of the lake. And uh, Jack comes up to me and says, come on, we're going to go for one more ride. And so I hopped in the boat without my life jacket. Mm. And um, Mike um, also had a V-Drive, just like um, Jack's V-Drive. And this this thing is, like I said, it's just a hull of a boat with two seats and a massive engine right behind you with these headers coming out. Mm-hmm. And so... I can still remember, Lee, when they both fired up those engines, the sound, the roar of those two two boats, and they took off racing across the lake. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh, testosterone. Uh, Yes. (laughs) Nothing like it at 20 years old. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But I – all I remember – were was was all I could see were the tops of the trees in the sky and I was terrified. I thought we were gonna run up on land. And I was screaming at the top of my lungs and I could not even hear myself scream. Mm. And the next thing I remember was he flew in my lap and out of the boat and I went back over the engine and but I don't remember hitting the water. Like, I don't remember any pain or anything like that. Wow. It's a good thing you weren't ki- uh, killed by the propeller on the on the engine. You know, the propeller's actually underneath the boat. Ah, I see. Yeah, because it's just, yeah, because it's, it's, yeah, yeah. The people, the people that were on, uh, you know, at the party, because we were way out in the middle of the lake, mm-hmm. right? At that point when the boat flipped, they said that you, they said that, they could see the marina on the other side of the lake underneath our boat. That's how high we were coming, you know, off wow. the water. Wow. Yeah. So uh, when you – you don't remember when you hit the water. Do you, Were you um, unconscious when you drowned? You know, I, I – you know, the, what happened next was it was as if someone just pushed rewind. And I immediately started – like I don't remember going through a tunnel – I may have gone through a ton, I'm sure, you know, but, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but, you know, maybe it's because the, the, you know, hitting the water at a hundred miles an hour is pretty violent, you know, experience. But, um, my first memory was it was like someone pushed rewind and I started reliving every moment of my life, but I wasn't just reliving it. I was experiencing it. 
from every point of view. But I was also above myself, watching myself relive it. And it was more real than when it happened the first time. Huh. So this is what when people say my life, my life flashed before my eyes. That's what was happening to you. But you were watching it happen to you. I was watching it and I was also I was also reliving it. But I was also reliving it from everyone's point of view. And it's like it's like this. If, if you're kind to someone. When you go through your life review, you feel that person's joy. Or if you hurt someone's feelings, you feel that person's pain. Right. You know, and, and it's, you know, something, I, you know, cause this was one thing that I spoke to God about, you know, many years later, because it was something that was, because I remember when I came back, I, I, there were two things that really stuck out to me was, was one, how did God record everything about my life? Like, God, how did you do that? You know, <laughs> this was like in 1979. There was no Internet. I had never heard of a near death experience, mm. you know, but um, but that was something that was just quite amazing to me. And also there was no time where I was time. Mm. And so when I came back, I, I felt that stark difference from being in that dimension to being back here. Like it was so, so palpable to me, the difference between being in a place that was the time did not exist to all of a sudden being back here again. Mm -hmm. And when I would wake up in the morning and I was literally, you know, black and blue from head to toe, it was like somebody had beat me with a baseball bat. (laughs) And so, you know, I'd get up and sit there on the end of the bed every morning for for many weeks. And, you know, all of them, everything about my near death experience would just be right back there in, in, you know, in my, in my memory. And I would just ponder about many of the things that, that I experienced when I was there. Well, let's talk a little about um, what happened after you had your life review. What was, what was the next thing that you experienced? Well, the next thing that happened was I transitioned into a light. Um, and, and I will say the thing is, is that because you are in this space where time doesn't exist, you know, we live in this linear time where, you know, it's, you know, you know, I got up and went into the kitchen and then I got a cup of coffee and then, you know, I sat down and, you know, uh, you know, ate my breakfast. It, yeah, that's it, linear life for sure. That's pretty linear life, but this, this isn't, you know, so when I say this happened, it could have been, you know, it was almost as if the past, present and future were all happening at the same time. And I don't even know how to explain that other than that's what it felt like. Right. But the first thing that happened when I transitioned into the light was I felt like this bliss, like like um, a, a sense of peace. I I had, you know, this this divine love was just wrapped around me and um the, my my memory of my life that i had just lived on earth was not even a distant memory to me i was mm-hmm. me i was still me but that life was not even like in it, i knew i was what what people say their home yes that's exactly how you feel you feel so very safe and so as I was in this bliss and it was, it was like, it was like I was like plugged into the motherboard and, you know, I had this expansious experience of like everything, just all your senses are like supersized. Mm. But, you know, I was, it was like this infinite divine consciousness you know, that you, you just, you ha- you really don't have any questions. It's like you, you have this knowing, uh, right. and, and that's the only way I can explain it. Um, and, but then all of a sudden I heard these words, you cannot stay. Was, were those the first words you heard? Yes. On the other side. And, and did, you, did you know it was God speaking? Oh yes. Hmm. And I panicked. And then, and then I just like, almost like knocked me out of the bliss. <laughs> yes. I mean, but all of a sudden I panicked and I started begging God not to send me back. Mm-hmm. And then at one point I stopped and I thought to myself, Oh my God, I am arguing with God. Mm-hmm. You know, like I had that self realization. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
And then God chuckled. It was, and it was almost as, as if God was like, yeah, I've heard that a million times, you know? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that God has a sense of humor about these things. Yeah. Oh, oh it, well, he created the sense of humor. So. <laughs> yeah, right. But he, he also shares in it, apparently. That's good. Yeah, exactly. It's good, good for us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. And so during that time, you know, I was shown, God showed me many things. And, but this is the part that, I didn't really understand until many decades later the connection to that conversation. And then God did reveal to me later, you know, what that conversation was about in my life. And so and I know now why I was not to remember that what we spoke about. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that was so profound um, that that I just think and, and so beautiful as well. Um, At one point, this dark circle appeared in front of me, and around it, it had a light that moved like a flame, but it wasn't a flame. It was, but but it it moved like a flame. And as soon as I looked at it, I instantly knew that I was looking at a heart that was that had resentment and was unable to forgive. And as soon as I had that thought. That circle started shrinking and getting smaller and smaller until it was a tiny dot. And when that dot disappeared, it turned into pure light. And then all of a sudden I felt, um, this like, like, uh, I was like almost, pu- I was like, I was pushed back by this, this wave of love that just washed over me. Mm. And I knew that God showed me, was, had shown me, not only what forgiveness looked like to him, but what forgiveness felt like. Ah, nice. And, yeah, and that that's something that I just, you know, I, I you just can't forget something like that. Right. Now, you recall having conversation uh, with God, some of it to do with uh, your future life, um, but that you forgot those things, those events until they they occurred in your future. But do you remember any of the other conversation that uh, that you had with him? Well, you know, we we um, well, yeah, well, he he told me that um, at one point, um, you know, I, I I remember like almost like asking him, like, you know, like, how does this end? Like, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like, is everything going to be OK? You know, like mm-hmm. I had a question. And w- was that about your life or no, just about, about the world? About the world where in I was general, in, the world oh, in general, like, is everything going to be OK? Like I had that curiosity. Sure. And the light parted and I was shown Earth from above. And I saw these silver streaks coming off of Earth. And as soon as I looked at it, I knew that God was showing me peace on Earth. Like, like, like we were talking, but, but I was having like the feelings and the talking. Like he was showing me and telling me at the same time. And I, I don't know how to explain that, but that was one thing that was like so prevalent. That I remember, but then at the same time, like I said, it's like the past, present, and future is all happening at the same time. Mm-hmm. At that very same moment that I, when I looked at Earth, I immediately knew that it was peace on Earth that I was looking at, and I, but I immediately knew that it was in the future and it was not in my lifetime. Like that, just like God put, like God told me that, like this is. You know, like he was showing me, yes, it does happen. There is going to be peace on earth. And, but I immediately knew it was not in my lifetime. Uh, that's yeah. too bad. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it happens, I guess, you know, I mean, I, 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 I just always wondered, like, you know, because I remember I, that was like kind of my question, like, is it going to always be like that or, <laughs> you know what I mean? Did you, did you see any other beings, uh, or get any other communications? Were there any angels or uh, relatives of yours who deceased? Yes. Well, the light parted at, at one point, and I stepped out into, like, this meadow, and there were trees and grass and, and these, like, a field of, of daisies. 
and um, there were beans, you know, in, 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 that were in the meadow. And I don't know what they were all doing. I remember seeing, you know, it, 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 to be to be honest with you, it was sort of like at that point, it was so overwhelming to see it and, and to see that perfection, Lee, mm. that it, it was like it, you just had this. But I had this memory of I. it was almost like I've been here before, like, I, you know, but it was just taking in the beauty of just pure perfection. So I wasn't really pay, paying attention to what other people, if the people that were there, whatever they were doing, I wasn't really paying attention to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all of a sudden, I remember my attention was drawn over to my right and I saw my father who had died when I was 12 mm. and I just ran to him. And, 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 and as soon as I got close to him, it was like I ran into a wall of love that exploded. And that's the only way I can explain it. And, and if there was such a thing as a, as a meter that could, um, that you could gauge, you know, love on it, mm. that, that meter would have, have, you know, be, have been off the charts and exploded. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just so, and my father, he was young. He was about 26 years old and he had on a white t-shirt and, um, he said to me, do not be afraid. I will always be with you. And um, I, I remember at some point there was all of a sudden there was like, I felt the presence of, of two people beside me. But I was so focused on my looking at my, my father's face. I really didn't pay attention. But I remember having the feeling of the presence of two people or, or two, two, you know, of the presence on both sides of me. And um, I heard God say, Remember what you can, um, and when you return, you will spend eternity with your mother and father. And I immediately turned to my left, and to my left, there was a man standing beside me, and he was very tall. I, I don't, you know, I didn't really notice what he was wearing. I now know that was my guardian angel, and he, and he didn't have wings, but I remember looking at his face, and it was like, you know, like when you see somebody and you can't remember their name, but you know that you know them. Mm-hmm. And that's what it was like. And he picked me up and I remember him picking me up. And um, then I just had the feeling of being on a roller coaster going backwards. And, and then all of a sudden I was back in my body. Mm. Wow. And so was that, that that's well, where things get kind of. Just to me, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because as soon as I opened my eyes, the, um, you know, the water, um, the water, you couldn't even see your hand, you know, in front of your face. And I had lost my equilibrium, um, from hitting the water at a hundred miles an hour. And so, um, the first thing I thought when I opened my eyes was which way is up. And I was on a swim team. I was a very strong swimmer. Mm-hmm. But at this point, you know, I was just completely disoriented. And I heard a voice outside of my body that said, follow the bubbles. Now, the, the sun had already sat like behind it. It was still light out, but the sun had already sat behind the the hills. So there was just, there wasn't very much light at all. But then all of a sudden a streak of light appeared in front of me. And then I, as I looked up, I saw about a foot or so above my head, a bubble. And I swam towards that bubble and then another one and another one until I got to the surface. And when I popped up, there was about, I don't know, five or six boats, people diving in the water looking for my body. And the mm. impact of hitting the body, I mean, hitting the water had shredded all the clothes off of my body. And somebody just grabbed me and pulled me in one of the boats and put a towel around me. And um, they were just in shock. You know, they just like, how are you alive? Mm. And um, I, I noticed that my eyes were bleeding. So they, you know, 
immediately got me to the emergency room. Right. How how was the fellow who was driving the boat? Did he survive? You know, yeah. What happened to him is because he went in my lap and it was like he bounced. When mm-hmm. he hit the top of the water, he was like a rock. He skipped along the top of the water. Wow. Yeah. And because... <laughs> I was because he sort of blocked me at that time when the boat because the boat like sheared um, from the drive from the driver's side. When it hit, it sheared from the driver's side over to the uh, to the passenger side. Like, you know, you know, when it when it sheared and then the boat was actually stuck. It was because it was fiberglass. It had an air pocket in it that Hmm. kept the boat from sinking. But the engine was underwater. But the the tip of the boat was sticking out of the water. So I'm not sure exactly how they ever got that boat out of there, but I'm sure they did. (laughs) Yes, yes. Well, so did you tell anyone about this uh, um, event at that time? You know, um, I I, I think I told – well – I, I think I mentioned it to just like a couple of my close friends and they just kind of looked at me like, what? You know, so I, <laughs> I didn't, you know, like, okay, Angela, you know, <laughs> I mean, and they knew that I, you know, I was a Christian. I, I grew up, uh, uh, my parents didn't go to church at the time, but, but I had, had, uh, joined St. Giles Presbyterian Church and it was, uh, um, very progressive for its time and we could wear blue jeans and there were guitars and it was all young people. And, you know, so, um, but you know, in my late twenties, I wasn't going and attending church as much as I had when I, when I was in my youth. Um, but you know, I, I just, no, I didn't, I didn't like go around telling people because it was sort of something that was just kind of very sacred to me. And I, and I just was like, wow, you know, and, but I didn't really, um, it wasn't until later that I understood what it, what it all meant. Mm. And that was like in the first six months after that near, my near death experience, I put two very bad men behind bars. Mm. Um, one of them was a serial rapist and the other one was a carjacker. And, um, you know, I, I talked the, the rapist into not killing me or raping me. And at one point, he drugged me down the hallway with the knife in my throat, screaming he was going to kill me. And I saw my father standing at the end of the hallway. And I looked this man in the eye and I said, you need to put your knife away. And he did. Mm-hmm. And the detective on the case said, Angela, you deserve an Academy Award. And I said, no, God, just put words in my mouth. And But – it wasn't until many decades later, because I at the time did not put the near death experience. I didn't make the connection between that and and what happened there until many decades later. All of a sudden, I had the the memory came back to me just kind of out of nowhere, and I went, "Oh, wait a minute!" And it was sort of like the conversation that I had with God. And then I realized, oh, I had agreed to do those things. It was almost like I pulled my soul into heaven, was preparing my soul to go through these things, you know, kind of giving me a pep talk, so to speak. (laughs) It was giving my soul a pep talk. (laughs) And um, so, so it wasn't until then, but then as I was having these memories and I remembered this is what the conversation that God and I had had. All of a sudden, the memory also was God said there was going to be three. And I went, oh, no, what's the third one? What is, you know, but I didn't think about it. And I just kind of went on about my, you know, about my life. And it wasn't until my minister brother stole my inheritance that it was like a light switch went off. And I went, oh, geez, this is it. Like mm-hmm. this, you know, it was in, in, you know, after that, God just literally stepped up in miracles. Things that have happened since then are just so amazing. I, I don't even know how to, you know, explain some of the things that have happened. Right. But there, but God limited it to three, including your accident. Was that, do you, no, or, or no. do you feel there's something else out there still no, waiting? No, no, I put the two men behind bars and then it was my brother. And this, ah, gotcha. Because stealing, stealing, 
the, the, the blessings of a loved one is probably the worst theft that you can commit. Yeah. Yeah. That's too bad. But God, uh, you know, that they're, they're going to have to face their life review too when the time comes. I mean, we exactly. all have to, we all have to account for what we've done and he, and he's going to have to feel what you felt when he did that. Well, you know, my mother came to me about in a dream about uh, about a month after she passed away. And um, it was uh, it, she was so real. I could have reached out and touched her. And um, she said to me, he set you up, needed witness first day in Richmond. And I got up and thought, what in the world is she trying to tell me? And so. I even sent my brother an email and I said, I had a dream about mom last night. And she said, you know, she said he set you up, needed witness for stay in Richmond. I said, do you know what this means? Right. Mm. Well, it's about a day because I'm thinking and I'm thinking, what did he get her to sign? You know, notary witness, that kind of thing. All of a sudden, I was downloaded a memory that was not in my purview. What, what whatsoever it was. And um, it, it, it just like came out of nowhere and I jumped up and was standing there shaking, going, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I heard the exact same voice that said, follow the bubbles. I heard the exact same voice say, in case you challenged him in court. And it was not my mother's first day in Richmond. It was my first day in Richmond. And it was something that only my brother and his wife knew. And I thought, oh, my goodness, God was letting me know. A, that my mother knows what my brother has done because there's no way. If I lived a million years, Lee, I would have never figured out, figured this out. But God allowed my mother to come to me and tell me something that only my brother and his wife knew. Mm. And I just, you know, I, I think that is almost as much of a miracle as my near death experience because, you know, it's like God saying, I've got control of this situation. And, right. And I need for you to, you know, follow and continue on because, you know, I could have just looked the other way and just said, okay, keep the money. Mm. You know, he sold her home or cashed out her, her retirement, took it, took everything, her car, uh, everything. And, you know, and it's not, this isn't about the money. And this is what I've realized because God put me back here to shed light on, on this type of greed that happens in families because my, my mother created one thing in her life, her family, that she loved more than anything. And my brother destroyed that for money. And mm. it's just, it's something I just can't wrap my brain around. But I know that he put me back here to shed light on on that and to let people know you don't get away with it. <laughs> you know, right. you think no one's looking and they're dead and nobody's going to know. They're going to know. <laughs> well, Angela, you can you can pursue this to bring justice for other people. And I think you said you were writing a book about it. But also bear in mind that that circle with a heart and that power of forgiveness and the yes. importance of forgiveness. So in your in your particular case, you you would heal and possibly heal some of your your brother's sins, too, by by forgiving him for what he did to you. You know, Lee, I, you know, there's a part of me that, that has already forgiven him. You know, I, I feel compassion, you know, and I actually have like this feeling like I feel sorry that he actually had to do something like this. Yeah. Um, you know, so I have that compassion for that, but, but I realized like I'm doing this following through with this for my mother because it was very important to her that she left something to both of her children. Sure. And, and, you know, and, and the Ten Commandments, it says, honor thy mother and father. Thou shalt not steal or lie, you know? <laughs> yes. Well, Angela, on that, uh, on that truth, uh, we have run out of time. So oh, wow. Already? Just like that. So I'm, I want to thank you so much for, for being on the show and telling us your story and, uh, and how it evolved into these experiences that you'd been given a, 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 a picture of before before you uh, left God's presence, but which you didn't really remember until it happened. I, I've heard other people with that s same kind of experience, and it's always an amazing thing to, to know that that truth is already known. Like you say, there's no, no time in heaven. There is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. Exactly. 
Well, folks, if you'd like to listen to this show again or any of our past shows, just go to nderadio.org and hit the past shows button. And for a more NDE Radio, please tune in next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.